Good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to this morning's keynote conversation. Uh, I have one announcement to make um, apropos uh, the presentation that's very important um, before I even introduce um, the conversants. Um, and that's uh, please do not tweet um, uh, Ezra Al Shafai's image uh, or indeed what she says in a live way. Uh, she's under, as anybody would know who's followed um, her feed, under enormous constraint where she lives um, that could you know, literally lead um, to dire consequences. So please respect that. Um, there will be an avatar image um, on the screen, um, a sort of outline of it. Uh, you're welcome to use that, but please don't use her, the actual image of her persona. Um, thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to welcome both uh, Ezra Al Shafai and Henry Jenkins this morning um, for this conversation. We think it will be very exciting. For more than a decade, uh, Ezra Al Shafai has worked as a blogger, a civil rights advocate, and youth leader using network communications to build platforms which deployed new media tools to amplify the voices of oppressed and unrepresented groups in the Middle East. And we'll hear some more about that, I'm sure, uh, in the exchange this morning. Henry Jenkins needs, in a sense, no introduction to all of us. He's been here from the beginning. He's been a fellow traveler in many, many more uh, ways than one. Uh, he's headed the Media Activism and Participatory Politics Research Group, which has sought to better understand <coughs> the political lives of American youth who are seeking to change the world by any media necessary. Um, we certainly like that. In this conversation, uh, they'll compare notes reflecting on what we uh, know now that we did not know a decade ago about the Arab Spring, after Occupy, the role of digital media in all of that, uh, after Black Lives Matter, and indeed, hopefully, he says, after Donald Trump, um, about the ways young people may or may not be able to use social media to bring about social change. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Israel Shafai and Henry Jenkins. Well, hello, everybody. I, I, I have a certain poignance in thinking about the fact that I was able to introduce the first plenary speaker at DML1, and that we're doing the last plenary session here as DML transforms into the connected learning event that we heard about yesterday. How many people are here for the first DML? Just curious. Uh, there's a fair number of us around, around the room. There, I'm happy to see all the new faces we've accumulated along the way, the growth of this has been something absolutely extraordinary. But it's also great to see the continuity of village elders, shall we, we can call ourselves now, who've been here from the beginning and have remained connected to this network and to each other through these, through these years. And I just thought I'd take a minute to acknowledge that before we jumped in. You know, our instructions here are to bring the hope uh, after Dana's powerful, challenging opening remarks which crushed many of our dreams and left many of us, but ended with a really uplifting call to arms, uh, a suggestion that we are the foot soldiers in a struggle over the nature of truth and literacy and critical thinking in America today, and that that has enormous political consequences. And I think there's so much in that context we have to learn from the events that have taken place in the Arab world, events that have taken place along the Gulf in recent years, which is why this is a really exciting opportunity. So I'm really here to learn and to listen and to be your, in, sort of draw things out that we as collectively want to know. We'll, we'll spend about half the time talking among the two of us and then an open up for the floor. So be thinking about questions you might have um, and things that you want, you want to know. And I think there's no shame in asking a question that comes out of ignorance because we're here to learn. But a question that comes out of prejudice, I think we want to weigh very, very carefully uh, at, at the current moment. Um, so, I, so I encourage you to think 
thoughtfully about what we want to know. But I thought I'd begin by just asking Ezra to set the scene for us. Tell us a little bit about your country and some of the challenges you face in doing activism in your country. Sure. Um, so I come from Bahrain. It's a very small country, slightly larger than this room. <laughs> Um, and it's a little island sandwiched between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So strategically, it was very interesting growing up and you know, living there all my life. Um, So, and we also learned that when the technology is new, we play with it, we experiment with it to see what it can do before we pull it toward more political causes. So can you describe a little bit your process of initiation into the digital? You just started down that path. But how did, how did you go from access to information to becoming fully engaged as an activist? I mean, I thought the internet was just one guy writing on his computer. <laughs> and I wanted to, I was like, how can I get in touch with this guy? <laughs> so I, I really, we, I mean, we were.
are really huge, comics are really huge. Um, if you look at a lot of the video commentary in the region, even to this day, um, the only w one of the most important ways that we deal with trauma is through humor. So yeah, I created it and I invited a couple of my friends and we started you know, um, writing political satire and then we figured a year later, you know, it was getting a lot of traction and we thought, hey, this could be really something a lot bigger than that. Um, so we uh, created another website called uh, Bahrain Uncensored, uh, which was ironically censored the very next day. <laughs> um, where we wanted to talk about just all the things that we weren't allowed to talk about as young people. And that's when we realized, hey, there's limitations to the internet. It's not where you, just a space where you can go um, and talk about all these different things. And um, so that journey was really difficult um, because at the very first time, I was incredibly naive. I thought, wow, the internet is really the place where we can go and there's no consequences. Nobody's gonna charge you for saying anything. There are no laws that disable you from saying these things. Um, but as soon as the internet started um, gaining a lot of traction and the blogosphere tr um, started getting a lot of traction, for, we went from a couple of dozen of people that used the blogs to a couple of hundred, eventually thousands. And then the government made it a rule where you had to, every time you register a domain or even create a blog for yourself, uh, you had to register it with the authorities. We had the Ministry of Information where they had to log all that information. Um, so we were really concerned about the future of the web, the future of the open web, um, digital privacy, security, and that's really what got me to think, we really have to double down on our struggle here. We can't just keep going to wordpress.com, blogspot, and all these things. And we have to really create platforms. And that's when I started getting into development, learning how to create plugins with WordPress and trying to figure out open source software and tools about how do we really you know, piss off dictators, but in a more sustainable way. <laughs> um, and at the same time, how do we engage our own community? Because that's another big challenge for us at the time was, how do we get other young people interested in, in discussing these things? Um, a lot of my peers in school, their priority was really um, downloading music um, and movies, you know, piracy and things like that. Um, but I really wanted them to also um, engage in a more deeper level to talk, a deeper level to talk about things like human trafficking, you know, slavery, the things that are very common in the Gulf even to this day, um, corruption of political ministers that we have, you know, we have just so many things that were going on that we weren't able to talk about. And we really just wanted to build a platform to bring a diverse number of people together and kind of put them head to head on all these issues, members of the Baha'i faith, which is arguably one of the most persecuted faiths in the Middle East, um, Kurdish minorities, you know, that were around the region, um, that have been heavily persecuted and have, you know, survived genocides and many other issues, and really going to these communities and saying, would you be interested in sharing a platform of this kind and sharing your story so that we can learn from you? And that really is what started um, my organization and, and took me to where, where I am today. So how young were you when you were first censored by the, your government? 16 and a half, I think. 16. And what was that experience like? I it was really scary for sure, you know. I immediately went and I um, closed up the curtains. <laughs> you know, you feel watched, you feel, but at the same time you had to understand you really can't be that naive. You know, that's something that even today a lot of young people, um, you know, when, when you've experienced censorship, that's really when you understand that it could be a lot worse than this. For me, I didn't, you know, a lot of people when they experience censorship, they're a lot more courageous than I am. They would go and organize a protest, and they would go and they would, you know, create another website with the exact same content, or be more vocal about it. But I was really concerned for my safety and mostly the safety of my family, because I obviously I lived with them, so if they trace the IP, which at the time I didn't know how to mask, you know, they were gonna go and attack my family and I really didn't want that to happen, obviously. So I really had to think beyond, you know, um, beyond my own personal security. So what kind of mentorship did you have through this process? Um, I really, really it was the local bloggers that kind of drove me to this. Um, we had a lot of people, um, you know, early on that were writing for communities that were already starting to spring up like Global Voices and a couple of others which had um, a healthy number of authors from the Gulf region. 
And so I would always go to them and ask them, you know, how do you do this and how do you do that? And I'm pretty sure some people blocked me along the way. <laughs> you know, they're like, tell me again how to start a WordPress site. <laughs> so. So we've heard here a lot about the Arab Springs as Twitter revolutions, and there have been debates about how significant social media has been and change in that region. What is your, your sense of that? How is it, is it purely Twitter or much more than that, presumably? No, it's definitely much more than that. I mean, we grew up amongst these kinds of protests all the time. In 1999, I mean, in Bahrain, we've had one of the biggest protests, you know, in, in the country. We didn't have Twitter back then. You know, so calling it a Twitter revolution, we could also call it a shoe revolution because we all were wearing shoes at the same time, you know? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you were using. I mean, Twitter was being used against us very much. Um, I mean, Twitter was also um, the reason why um, hundreds of people have gotten arrested throughout the Gulf region. So you can call it a, a Twitter revolution if you want, but that's not a positive thing necessarily, you know, because it also revolutionized how people censor and surveil content, how you troll people on the internet. Um, it really amplified the voices of cyber bullies who put the lives of LGBTQ individuals at risk. All the voices that were also very prominent during you know, the Arab Spring and whatnot. So it's very important for us to kind of understand the context. You know, we, we were gonna use whatever means we had to make this possible, um, whether it's just plain technology like SMS, whether through email. I mean, I heard m and I received much more information through email than I did through Twitter, you know? People were more comfortable sharing personal videos, sharing videos of people being shot at and saying, where can we circulate this? Um, and it wasn't necessarily just happening on Twitter. The other thing was that there was a war of misinformation. There were uh, pro-regime trolls that were there and saying, oh, this video was actually taken from Yemen when it was not, or this video was taken from the 90s when it was not. Or sometimes people from abroad retweeting things that were inaccurate, you know, so I mean, it, it really resulted in this kind of chaotic atmosphere, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, just so many other tools out there that were used, but it doesn't mean it was used wisely, you know, and so we're still kind of struggling even today. Um, how do we verify information? Um, how do we post information, but in an ethical way without exposing somebody's identity against their will? I mean, the people that were shot at, maybe their families didn't want, you know, there were certainly families there that were saying, you know, this is my son being shot at. I would really much prefer that this is not spread online because it's graphic and his kids might see this one day. But people said, you know, oh, but we're posting this to make change because, you know, this is much more than just your son. So it really created a lot of these kinds of conversations between families as well. Some people said, yes, please, I want my kid to be used, you know, as a symbol. And they would go on the media and talk about their children in that way or their siblings or their spouses or whoever it is, their friends, and other people, they would say, leave us alone. We don't want to be engaged in this way. We're also scared for our life and we're not ready. You know, and, and we had to really understand how do you respect people's boundaries? It wasn't just about people versus the government. It was also about ethics. It was also about learning what the limits are and just how personal this conflict is. So what is your assessment of how much progress has been made in the so-called Arab Spring? movements. I mean, some have seen it as a as breakthrough, some as setbacks. How would you assess the current moment? I mean, I would think it's a breakthrough, breakthrough in the sense that we all feel that much more engaged and we all see the importance of being engaged. I mean, that's something we've been fighting for a decade ago that we finally see happening now. You know, um, telling um, members of the LGBT community, be heard, you know, we don't have to hide anymore. Um, telling people from ethnic and religious minorities that if we don't stand up now, you know, I mean, this will just continue to happen. And then the other thing is that had we been more prepared, maybe these movements were not going to be hijacked, you know, by other forces that were more prepared to take advantage of chaos or at a time of instability. So that's why I think now we are a little bit more aware of how to organize in the hopes that the next time something like this happened, it will lead to more progress. So what has happened to the struggle at the current moment? What are the tools that are allowing it to keep the spirit alive of what you're fighting for? I think the diversity of content. I mean, a lot of people have turned to films. A lot of uh, people have turned to music. I mean, music has really been an incredible transformation in the past couple of years. Um, and music in the Middle East has always been 
um, such an important tool for social justice advocacy because it's such a subtle and yet powerful way to um, make your voices heard and at the same time invite other people to your cause but in a very creative and interactive way. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the platforms that we run is called midistudents.com and it's basically a platform for underground and independent musicians in the Middle East and North Africa who use music as a tool for, for social advocacy. A lot of these individuals have been in, um, imprisoned or they're living in exile. Um, a lot of them have experienced um, censorship for their, for their music. Um, a lot of people here talk about blogging as a very important tool, but I would argue that music is actually that much more powerful. It's much more difficult to censor and it's much easier to go viral. You know, when you create a trans song that is about the Saudi regime that is also a little bit funny, of course I mean that's gonna spread versus, you know, a, a blog that is like, you know, um, more sad or, or just more realistic, you know, it's like, oh, I don't have my human rights, you know. <laughs> but, no, it's true, you know, and then when, when you sing about it in, a, in the form of hip hop, you know, I mean, people get, they're like, I don't have my human rights, you know. <laughs> and it's just like people, and then, but then you start thinking about it more, but, and in a more uplifting way, where it's like, get up and do something about it. Because the chorus in a lot of these songs is always, look, this is the reality of the situation. This is what we're dealing with. But you know what? Let's do something about it. Which is a lot more uplifting than in the end of a block spot. They're like, you know, when is this going to change or something like that. So I was really, I mean, what really got me into this and to the rights of religious minorities in particular was because I was listening to hip hop by religious minorities, you know, talking about their experiences. And that's something that I, would, I wasn't really super interested in before. But um, so that, that really made me understand the power and impact and influence of what music can do to really change the way we communicate with each other, about each other, about our, each other's struggles. And it can be about in, in however many languages that y you want. I mean, we have music in Arabic, Kurdish, Farsi, Turkish, um, you know, and, and, um, and, and it's just something that really brings us together in a really unique way, you know? And it's not in that cliche, let's all get together and share, you know, uh, something, but it's really, really much more deeper than that, um, which is, you know, that, that music can really be a tool that amplifies our voices in a way that just normal technology really can't achieve. You know, the websites and the applications that we create, I mean, that's really a lot of the time you're speaking to the choir. People who follow you on Twitter follow you because more or less they agree with you, you know? And so you keep creating the same content for the same people. But with music, it's different because you go to an event and nobody else might di agree that, you know, they care that much about this specific issue or that issue. Or even something as important as gender politics. I mean, how many hip hop musicians do we have coming out of Egypt who are women, you know, wearing the hijab and singing metal song? You know, that's something that a lot of people don't associate, you know, together. So, and there are a lot of metal musicians who are women, you know, we're very pissed off and this is a very good way to <laughs> blow up some steam. <laughs> so, so it's fascinating that hip hop, which comes from a very particular place in American society has emerged as a kind of global language of protest. Yeah. Americans are always anxious or are we simply imprinting the rest of the world with our culture, but it seems very powerfully that what you're describing are Egyptian voices Arab voices, people who are speaking their truths through hip hop, not hip hop speaking through them. Yeah, and using hip hop and also using local instruments with it. So it's not just using westernized forms of, you know, all these, um, all the music, all the guitars and the bass and western instruments, but it's really about, you know, um, the oud, you know, or Kurdish instruments or the sitar or other things and really trying to fight for your identity because it's not just about fighting for human rights and fighting for you know political participation and all these things but there are people on the platform that are fighting for their existence it, you know for cultures that have been erased by oppressive regimes and so for some people they're not thinking about politics but the very act of singing in Kurdish um, it was that in and of itself was a political act you know, so a lot of the time people would go and they would ask this Kurdish jazz artist, for example, you know, um, why don't you sing about freedom and independence? Because she says, my music is freedom and independence. I'm singing in my local tongue, you know? So, so that's something that's really powerful that sometimes people take for granted when they listen to music. 
Well, we've talked a bit about, I mean, I'm, I'm always fascinated with the ways pop culture bleeds into politics and vice versa, which is an essential focus of the work we're doing in the civic imagination. And we sort of already, you already talked about humor as an important tool and music. But we also, the United Dinner, talking about games as a mechanism by which to organize protest. And I know there's so many game scholars in the audience that that would be a great interest to them. Yeah, so one of the platforms that we run um, is for LGBT individuals in the region. And one of the issues that we face is obviously there's no place to go to talk about our identity because it's, you know, it's, we're being denied that very thing. Um, so when we, we create a lot of advocacy campaigns, but we know that we're not going to win LGBT rights anytime, probably not even in my lifetime, to be completely, you know, um, realistic about this. At the same time, we can't just sit around and say, let's just wait a couple of decades later. You know, someone will have a good life eventually. <laughs> we really wanted to say, um, it's time for us to kind of take control of our own narrative and to figure out what we can do without putting our lives and the lives of other people at risk. Um, so what we came up with was a discussion platform where we can go just to talk about the normal everyday life. It doesn't have to be, let's organize a protest, let's do this. I mean, we, we live in places where protesting is against the law, where you know, in Saudi Arabia you can't do that, in Bahrain you can't do that. There's so many places where you can't do that without being shot at or without being you know, um, arrested or imprisoned or seriously hurt you know, or denied travel. Just many, many consequences, the list goes on. So we don't necessarily have to put ourselves in that position to fight for justice. It doesn't have to be always on the front lines. You know, I mean, that is very important. But not everybody is ready to do that. And that's something we had to really take into account when building this platform where it was an issue of life and death. So when we created this discussion platform, our number one issue was trolls. I mean, cyber bullies were multiplying like insects throughout the internet. And we wanted to make sure how do we keep communicating with each other without, being it, without it being in public and without it being in a place that would compromise your identity um, or the community. So when we created this, um, it functioned in such a way where when you go in, it's kind of obscure. You kind of go and you create a topic um, and you say, you know, how do I come out to my family or should I come out to my family or something like, you know, my colleague suspects me of being homosexual. They're threatening to report me. I will lose my job. Um, just normal things like that that people go to um, on, an, on an everyday basis. And once you share an experience or an advice or a supportive comment that other people think is helpful, um, other people kind of come and they vote you on that or they say, yes, this was helpful, and you get more points. And then based on the amounts of points that you get, you unlock more and more features on the platform that you actually didn't even know existed. So when you first log in, you don't know that there's a chat room. But once you reach, for example, 2,000 points, you say, you know, we say congratulations. You know, the community thinks you're rad, you know, and, and you can now join our chat room. And it becomes difficult to infiltrate those more intimate spaces, like the chat room, where you can go and talk about more intimate topics or topics that you really want to discuss or, you know, even things as, you know, as taboo as STDs in a place like the Middle East. Um, you can do it without really fearing so much about somebody infiltrating it because you know that everybody there spent a significant amount of time being an encouraging member of the community already and they sort of have a verified you know status and that once you unlock you know once you have even more um, points than that you for example can now create your own chat room where it can be completely private and you can invite whoever you want and that makes it really difficult for trolls because in order to but you know, bypass those systems, it becomes really exhausting. So if you're, for example, a homophobe and you go to some place like this and you're trying to put other people's lives at risk, you have to say hundreds if not thousands of really nice things about LGBT people. <laughs> and maybe that changes your attitude somewhere along the way. That's true. And we've had a lot of people who've said that. You know, they said, you know, I really relate to what a lot of people have been sharing. Even though I'm not queer, I feel a lot of those things, a lot of those personal issues. Um, and we have a lot of siblings of queer people where they come in and they say, oh my God, my brother's gay, how do I fix him? You know, and people there talk about their experiences and they say that's not something you can fix. And there's all these kinds of conversations that happen. And that these people tend to just stick around. And instead of saying, how do I fix my brother, it's really t the conversation turns to how do I be a better ally to my brother? So um, 
So that's one way that we've managed. For the past seven years, we've had no bullies, no trolls in these private settings. You know, so um, it's really worked out really well for us. And that's another thing is that a lot of the time, people in the West, you know, it's sometimes interesting to see that you're still struggling with cyber bullies and trolls and things like that. Um, and people always think that things have to be built in Silicon Valley or in New York or in the West, and then you have to export it to the rest of the world because we don't understand how to deal with those problems in an innovative way. But between you and me, we're kicking ass. <laughs> 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 and uh, yes. so I think, you know, I think it's important that sometimes people have to look at the Middle East and Latin America and Eastern Europe because we go to these places to find information and innovation. When I think of innovation, I don't think of the US anymore. I mean, there's all these pretty, pretty flying things and the Teslas and stuff like that. But when you really talk about innovation on a deeper human level, this is not the place to go for inspiration, to be very frank with you. you know. So it's really the places where people have been undergoing human rights uh, violations. Um, and building things against incredible odds under very oppress uh, repressive societies. And if we manage to do that, you know, I think everybody else obviously can. So sometimes we're shocked by the lack of innovation in civic technology when we see the US. Because you're all still talking about voting and manipulation and fake news, and that's all like old news for us. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, I think we have a tremendous amount to learn from you. Um, so I'm curious, what advice do you have for us as we think about some of the political struggles that Dana described the other day? I think just like, you know, um, limit the distractions, perhaps, and really think about things on a more deeper level. There's just so many things being distracted, and I think, honestly, private foundations play a big role in this distraction, because every day they have a new fad that they want to fund. So you have to go to your back to your organization and do a new concept note about something you don't really understand just so you can unlock funding, unlock money. Free. Philanthropists here, <laughs> yeah. You know, and philanthropists here, they're not committed to one particular cause. I, you know, even wealthy individuals that want to find one thing or the other. I mean, after Trump, everybody, you know, completely abandoned everything else they're working on and then they're doing this, you know, and then tomorrow it's gonna be, oh, let's do open data for government. And then tomorrow, the day after it's like, oh, how do we fix transportation? And then going back to immigrants and then going back to the refugees, you know, and so there's not, there's no sustainability when you do this. I mean, we've, when in the Middle East, we stick to one issue, um, you know, and, and you really, really hit hard on that one issue. But if you're focusing on migrant rights or LGBT rights, you really kind of zone in and you focus. If there's no funding for it, sell your furniture to do it. That's what I did. You know, we, a lot of uh, me members from our team, when we didn't have the funding and a lot of people said, we'll only fund you if, we said, we don't thank you, but that's not what we're interested in. Here, we'll only fund you if, and a lot of people say, yeah, we, we, okay, we'll do that. You know, and we see that because we see that with a lot of our partners here and a lot of the organizations, it's just jumping from one thing to the other just to get things funded, you know, and that's just not how you make progress. Well, you've, you've dealt a lot with religious uh, discrimination in your country, and we're looking at Islamophobia as a mounting challenge in the United States. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on what we should be doing to help support our, uh, our American Muslim youth? Yeah, fund Muslim-run startups, you know? I mean, they're also doing great stuff, and don't just support the token Muslim guy who's an intern at the back, you know? I think really double down on making sure that Muslims here feel like they themselves are really um, engaged people of the community and a lot of them here have really amazing ideas that are not being supported at all because they're just never been, you know, that prized population where everybody goes to, you know, that shiny new thing to fund. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, I mean, don't fund Muslims just because they're Muslims as well, uh, but at the same time, they're just also here you know, a huge amount of Muslim Americans who have a lot of means. And when we see them, they're just not that engaged, really, with a lot of the stuff that's going on in this community. So we just like to invite more people from our community that are here and that made a really wonderful living for themselves. Don't be scared to support this stuff. You know, I, I know I, I understand a lot of people came back home from trauma and traumatic situations, but I see people from the Gulf who made a great living in Bahrain, and when we talk to them, they say we can't support any of this, even though we We'd love to because we're scared, you know? And I say, fuck the fear, you know, just do it. It doesn't matter. I mean, we're doing this and, and people in the Middle East, we're li they're living under airstrikes. 
under dictatorships and every day we're waking up and we decide for ourselves we're going to make this happen. At some point you have to wake up and realize this is the part of the struggle that I want to take part of, you know? And, and it's just there's no room for fear any, anymore. You just have to take risks and just keep taking risks until you kind of figure it out, you know? And that's another thing for foundations as well. They want to fund just the, the same couple of people. You know, the Human Rights Watch and the this and that and just a handful of other organizations. And that's not where the innovation is, you know? Um, there's just so many great, amazing, smaller startups that are happening, civic te focusing on civic technology, focusing on just really interesting and exciting things that could really make a lot of impact. And they're just not being supported at all, you know? They're not getting 501c3 stati statuses. They're not, you know, I didn't even know what that was. I thought it was a disease. You know, people would come to me, they're like, do you have 501c3? Be like, no, no, I got my che myself checked up last year. <laughs> And we can't unlock any funding in the U you know, in the U.S. for that reason, you know. And so I just think it, it's just there's just so much bureaucracy, and it just it doesn't have to be there, you know. Just get out of this little bubble that it's just time, you know. I'm all pumped up now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So if we want to remain more connected with the struggles that are going on in your country, what's our best way to do that from here? Just visit the platforms, visit the websites, you know, check out what people are working on. I mean, just there's so many exciting things that are happening in the Middle East right now. It's just a really interesting time to be there. So there's just so much um, innovation that's happening. Um, there are just so many, especially queer women in technology, is just absolutely skyrocketing, you know. And they're just, the lack of support, though, is really demotivating for us. Because we can't keep going by selling stuff, our stuff, you know, and selling a car so you can fund your servers for the next 12 months. When we're seeing the kind of stuff that's being funded around the world, a lot of it is unfortunately garbage, you know? You know, but, but no, I don't mean this as disrespect, but I've, I only say this because I've seen the research. <laughs> and it's just, it's very disappointing what's, what's being supported today. And people don't just, they don't question how philanthropy is broken, and it really is. You know, and I think we, for us to really, it's not about people getting out there and let's mentor them and support them in doing stuff. All the time people want to fund the workshops to make that happen. But then what about funding the stuff that comes out after these workshops? People come to the Middle East, you know, and they come and they do these drive-by workshops and here's how to code, you know, an open source platform. Great, who's gonna pay the servers when I launch this thing, you know? So that's the thing we're lacking right now. It's not necessarily just the education. I mean, people are learning the skill set very frequently. You know, there's just all these tools that are already available online. Workshops is not what we need right now. What we need is support, ongoing support, um, to help um, with, with the cost to do the kind of thing that we're doing. And it's this kind of thing that affects everybody here. A lot of the time, people think of the Middle East, and they're like, it doesn't matter. You know, they're always killing each other, you know? but. It's, it's something that affects the whole, the whole world, you know? I mean, it's your budgets that are funding the wars there. If you want more things that to go towards housing and education, make sure you're not killing us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think... <laughs> so, uh, one of the things we do at our Civic Imagination workshops is ask people to share the stories that inspire them. So what, you're someone clearly with enormous hope given all of the things you're struggling with. So what kinds of things do you take inspiration from? It's just, it's, it's a lot of things. Um, I'm really encouraged by just how minorities, you know, like the Delates, for example, and how they've been able to just amplify their voices in such an interesting way across the years, through films, through podcasting, through trying to understand how to fight for their history, you know? Um, on, online, where everywhere they go, for example, in places like Wikipedia, they can't reference their scholars, they can't reference, because it's all stuff that's been suppressed and censored and considered bad quality. So a lot of the time, you know, people always have to say, oh, well, if it hasn't been written by a white person in North America, then it probably didn't happen. You know, so that's the kind of thing I see a lot of people struggling with. How do you educate people? How do you increase information online? Um, and just, if, and of course being back home, just really seeing how people as vulnerable as migrant workers are using digital communication to fight for their peers who are going through human trafficking and sexual slavery and, you know, labor violations on a daily basis and putting their life on, 
on the, on the line by going out there and, and taking videos and putting it on YouTube without even being literate themselves and facing years and years in prison or in Saudi Arabia flagging or worse, beheading or, you know, and that's the kind of thing people go through just to be heard. So these are the stories that when we see, you know, when we compare ourselves to, we say what I'm going through is absolutely nothing compared to what this guy's going through and how they've put their lives on the, um, uh, on the line to make their voices heard. So I think it's just important for us to kind of continue pushing, fighting for our dignity, and fighting to take control of our own voices online, and not really just waiting constantly for other people to speak on our behalf, or to speak for us, because we own that voice, and now we earn that voice. You know, and I think the only thing people can do here for now is at least listen to them, because people have literally put their lives on the line for you to listen, so that's all that we ask. Oh, and some money. <laughs> so is there a vision of a better world that you're fighting to achieve, or just fighting to survive? Yes, um, I mean, it would be a world where, when you, uh, where we can easily hold powerful people accountable in an effective way, because we're tired of every time you go and you raise an issue, that person is above the law, you know, whether it's, Ivanka Trump or, <laughs> you know, in our case, the dictators and things like that. If we stop, that's the kind of thing that's going to continue to happen. We see it all over Europe, crooks getting away, away with a lot of things. And even in Australia, people getting away with just horrible things that they're doing with refugees. Um, it's just something that we have to keep doing consistently is to hold people accountable for injustices. Because the moment we stop doing that, we start creating a world that we can't bear anymore, you know? So Dana yesterday, w yesterday was talking a lot about misinformation, distortion, fake news is the phrase here. Well, are there some strategies or tactics that you've found that are effective at ch cutting through the bullshit coming out of governments in the Middle East? There's so much of it, you know? We need like a bullshit mask. <laughs> But um, because they've just, cannot, they, they've just caught on with the internet now, the bots have really become really difficult. Um, every time you tweet a certain word, you start seeing so many bots kind of come and attack you um, with already pre-existing information um, or sometimes very targeted things that they would release, you know, your information, your information for your family and things like that. So that's really been a challenge that we've never experienced before. So with Dana, I understand a lot of the pessimism because we experienced that quite a bit. Um, and so, what were you asking, sorry? Uh, were there, there any strategies yeah. for actually dealing so with those problems you found? Just persistence is really the thing that we found. It's persistence, and in the persistence in, in creating new platforms that bypass that. You know, I mean, we spent seven years iterating and building the LGBT platform to specifically bypass this issue of, you know, how do we talk about our identity without it being, um, a threat to us or without putting our other peers, um, uh, uh, their lives at risk as well. So it's really just been about, um, we don't use existing technology as much as we create it. You know, if you go to Majal.org in our platform, everything we do, we've created it from scratch. We don't just rely on Facebook and Twitter and what the West makes available to us. You know, we, we really enjoy a lot of the open source software that's coming out, whether it's Ruby on Rails, uh, many other things. Um, and we take that and we learn it and then we develop tools with it, something that we imagine, you know, this would be Twitter, but for sane people, for example, you know? Or, you know, this would be a music streaming platform, but for socially conscious music so that you don't have to go through, you know, genres that you don't like or mu music that is completely meaningless. Um, so it's really about th things like that, is, is create your own reality if you don't like the one that you have now. And it doesn't have to be a place where Reddit, you know, there's millions of people using it. For us, we're quite happy. Seven years, 7,000 users, you know, growing by a couple of hundreds every year. You don't have to always create a community where th that's attracting millions and millions. I think creating niche communities works perfectly well for the internet. There's nothing stopping us from creating that kind of model or environment. We don't all have to go and hang out on Facebook and be like, hey, everybody else is here too, you know? It's just like go and kind of live out, you know? And, and the internet is so limitless. Sometimes we're shocked by the, how little people are doing with it in that sense. So I think when it comes to community and running communities and how to moderate a community and how to engage with communities, it's really about 
you create your own ideal version of what that community might look like and start inviting people to it and you'll be surprised what the results are. So I'm gonna open the floor in just a sec. I wanna just take a minute to talk about our situation here and think about what we learn from st understanding more deeply the kinds of tactics and strategies, the modes of survival, the forms of community, the play and wit of the Middle East as it's confronted some of these challenges. Because I think as a society, we are moving in toward a period that could well be like the 1960s, a period of enormous political upturn in American life, particularly on campuses, particularly at high schools, where we as teachers and educators are gonna be forced to make decisions about how we relate to our students as they're involved with struggles like the ones that Ezra has just described. How do we help a 16-year-old girl who just gets censored by the government? And what role would we play as mentors in responding to some of the situations challenges and opportunities we've heard here. We have plenty of examples in recent years of powerful movements where young people have helped to change the society, whether it's the Dreamer movement, the Occupy movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and many others that we will see uh, that are making a difference in the world. And the choice is, do we, how do we, as somewhat older, people in this room respond to those challenges and engage with those struggles in a productive way. So I would not want us to come out of a, co a conference like this hearing only the negative, only the challenges and the disruption, because those are all very real. And as someone who cares deeply about participatory culture, I care deeply about the stuff that Dana raised yesterday. But I still have hope for the kinds of struggle here as in the Middle East that Ezra is talking about as making a difference in our world and changing our reality. And so I don't think we dare as Americans lose hope when we hear stories like this, that this is such a powerful story for us to think about what can be done with, under conditions far more challenging than our own to make a difference in the lives of young people. So I, I don't want to be the one talking here. I'm really eager to hear Ezra, but I wanted to say a little bit to you about what I, what I see when I look at where we're at as a society today and why it matters that we do the work that we do in this room to extend the literacy and capacity of young people to participate in the digital future. So with that, let me open the floor to questions. Who has questions or comments that you would like to, like to explore? Here's a gentleman over, oh, down here, Zoe. Thank you so much for the conversation. I'm curious to know um, about access. Mm -hmm. So how prevalent are issues of access? For example, the young person who doesn't have access to internet, the technology, time, space, to explore some of the, the positive online communities you've mentioned? Yes, in the Gulf, we have a very high access rate. I mean, in Bahrain alone, more than 90% of the population is connected to the internet. Granted, we're only six people, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're not that low. Um, but, but that's something that we think about as well. Um, but in the past decade, we've added hundreds of thousands of more people to the internet. We just continue and continue to grow in that way. Um, the other thing is really um, people with no access. Um, that's why people turn to music, for example, and holding gigs and things like that, because it doesn't matter if you have access. It doesn't matter if you're even literate. If you just show up, I mean, that's just a really powerful way of connecting about these issues um, without necessarily having to be online. And then the second thing is films as well, is another thing. I mean, people may not have access, readily available access to the internet, but they still are able to kind of send um, films to one another. Um, they're able to kind of take videos of each other and, and things like that. Um, so there's just really different ways for people to bypass it. And then the other thing is, even if you don't have personal access there's always um, the libraries that people go to, the internet cafes, you know, and, thing, and many other places. I mean, when um, you go to Yemen, for example, not a lot of people would have access in their home, but there would be cafes everywhere where you can kind of go in these places and, and kind of just go and 
use the internet and find a lot of this kind of information? Um, no, not safely, you know, but um, a lot of the time where that's, a, there's nothing safe for us. I mean, you, you can walk down the streets just by passing a protest, that's also not safe. You know, so it's really just, if you're a curious person and you're trying to find political information, I mean, there's really no safe way to do it regardless if it's online or offline. Because if it's offline, you are gonna show up to a protest, you wanna hear the speeches, and then you're gonna be shot at, you know? And then the other way around, you go and you find the kind of information. Um, in some ways, it is safer to use them in cafes, but not since they've required the ID now in order to use it, you know? So it really depends where you go. But yeah, the issue of access is very important, of course, and that's something we always take into account. But it's definitely changing for the better. We're, we're really optimistic about just the number of people that have access. If you look at the numbers and percentages per Arab country and how upwards it is. Okay, there's a mic there. I'm curious with the, the Crowd Voice website, are you seeing the different groups that, that come onto the, the platform you know, collaborating and sort of sharing ideas, or how do you facilitate that sort of, of group uh, group work to solve these problems globally versus just individually? Yeah, that's actually a really good question because it reminded me also of the LGBT platform. We had a group in Bulgaria that said, wow, we actually want the same technology. So they went and they created their own kind of space, same backend, same functionality, but in Bul Bulgaria, you know, so we never thought that our tools would actually be applicable in other places around the world. With Crowd Voice, we built it actually just for the Gulf at the first. Uh, we were there talking about what's going on in Iraq. We were there talking about what's going on in Bahrain, the human rights violations, all these, uh, the protests and the crackdown. And then we started seeing so many people from Indonesia and Mexico coming to us and they say, hey, can we also add our stuff here? You know, and so when we started opening it up, it, it completely went global. And now um, most of the users that use Crowd Voice are actually not in the Middle East, they're in India and Mexico. You know, and there's people that use it, the, the Chilean student movements and just so many things that kind of opened up. Um, and that sometimes shows that you sometimes sol you know, solve problems for your own personal unique case, but it can really be applicable to other cases as well, very easily. Um, so that was really exciting and interesting for us. I mean, now with MIDI students, it, there's gonna be another version for Latin America, for example, because somebody in Venezuela said this would be a great idea because you also have a lot of social justice music that's being lost between different you know, SoundCloud accounts or just historically been lost and it's just not being archived and curated in the way that MIDI students has. And the technology is already built, so we can just give it to them and then they use it and it just keeps going, you know, so. It w it's always exciting for us when somebody from some place around the world comes to us and uses these things. Yeah, for sure. So it doesn't have to happen in Silicon Valley, you know? Okay, <laughs> next question. Oh. Thank you for that in in inspiring uh, talk. So I guess I am struggling with the central uh, paradigm of this session. Uh, which is revolving around this question, or at least in my mind I'm thinking, you know, with all the optimistic hope, have we been naive in ignoring the risks of engaging in civic action online? My colleague, Saeed Tuzel, who spent two years with me at the Media Education Lab, um, returned to Turkey to provide media literacy education to teachers in Turkey. And he was caught up in the purge and he was jailed for eight months. In the United States, academics and activists uh, can make civic action seem risk-free. And the danger is that when we talk about the real risks uh, that civic actors working in online spaces face, it can create fear. And that fear can actually diminish or destroy the capacity for people to engage in democratic practices. But self-censorship about the real risks creates another paradox uh, that interferes with our ability to answer honestly questions about whether social media can support democratic practices globally. So I'd love to hear your commenting on this sort of paradox about do we, do we talk frankly about the risks, the real cost of civic action online? Because to do so creates some backlash or consequences in potentially alienating people, increasing fear, 
if we suppress that information, we face another paradox. So what, what's the right stance here with the very real risks that civic online action has for individuals working in countries around the world? You want me you, to start? Or? Yeah, you can start. All right, so I think we probably bring very different perspectives to this question. From my point of view, the best, the most constructive way is to acknowledge the risk, but also to understand how people have confronted that risk and the tactics they've used to make a difference and to get to create safety for themselves. So to talk about dangers and risk without talking about safe, safe procedures and successful strategies seems to me to be absolutely what dampens any potential for civic, civic engagement. The problem is when we only identify challenges and don't talk about opportunities. But by the same token, I think we lie to people when we only talk about the best parts of a participatory culture and don't engage critically with the, the bad stuff, the dangers, whether it's the stuff Dana talked about yesterday or some of the challenges that we, we've been talking about here today. So it's not about blind hope, right? And it's not about blind fear. I think a lot of times we poke our eyes out and then complain when we're blindsided, right? We refuse to look and refuse to engage and are not able to move forward into something that's more constructive. And so to me, what's powerful about Ezra's story is that she's, she's not sugarcoating any of the dangers or the risk here at all, but there is still courage and there's hope and there's opportunity that comes through that because you've taken the steps necessary to keep yourself and your participants safe. Mm -hmm. as safe as you can yeah. under circumstances that are never, as you say, fully risk-free. But nevertheless, there's something driving you that's more powerful. Uh, the, the desire for change, the desire to, to build a world that you can live in, that's yeah. more powerful than the fear. And I think that's what we've got to take from these, these situations. And it's also communicating the dangers in a very straightforward way. I mean, even with the LGBT platform, for example, before you leave a private message, it says, by the way, do you know that you're going to risk your life by doing this? Because there's no way we can ever uh, say this is 100% secure. There's no such thing ever, you know? No matter how much you believe in the platform, no matter how much you invest in security audits and all these things, you're just never going to get there. You know, I mean, even the biggest platforms today are we're spending billions and billions of dollars, and they're still being hacked on a daily basis. So um, the most important thing is to ensure that people don't use these tools with the naivety that n there's not going to be any consequences, because that's what put us in trouble when we were 16, and we thought, oh, it's just fine, you know? Jeeves is going to let us do this. <laughs> but um, for us, it, it was that hard reality where, look, your peers are, this uh, other bloggers, all of, all of them are getting imprisoned, and they've got their homes raided, and by the way, guess what? You're next, you know? So you really had to ensure that, um, that other people understand that when you invite them to participate in a platform or to do the things that you're doing, that they understand that you might be in that position too. And as long as they're aware of that and they still use it, then that's up to them. We can't stop them from doing it. But we can also encourage them without understanding fully well what that could mean to their personal life. Because then, I mean, it's your responsibility, especially as a, if you administrate a website and somebody get, gets killed, I mean, that's not something that is easy to kind of get over. I mean, it's the most tra traumatizing thing to have to build something with the knowledge that it costs somebody their life. So it's really also um, a heavy burden when you create these different platforms that you have to take on your shoulders. So if you don't communicate that to your users, it's really difficult to accept eventually. So that okay. would be my, my take. But definitely still do it. <laughs> okay, next question. We've illuminated everyone in the room. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one over here. Okay. Mimi's going to. So I, I was um, really inspired uh, by your provocation that, you know, our goal shouldn't be to build, doesn't have to be to build the next Facebook, and we don't have to build a solution that works from, for everyone. And it was one of the things that I took from Dana's talk as well is that partially, I think one of the lessons from recent events is 
really owning and recognizing the limits of our agency and that that's actually a good thing mm -hmm. instead of being disempowering, like realizing that you actually, we actually serve very specific, um, like sustained commitments to specific communities is actually, I mean, an uh, underlying message that I think um, I heard from what you were saying, Ezra, that really struck home to me and this sort of idea of universal solutionism through these platforms is what blindsided us um, because we weren't keeping our eye on the ball and the very specific kinds of um, groups that we're serving. So in a way, it feels like as a design orientation or as an orientation towards activism, that feels very um, on target. My question for you, though, is, I mean, at least in the environment that you know, I find myself working in, there's so much noise out there. Mm -hmm. And finding your people on the open internet, like it's different for those of us who work in local place-based interventions and communities. I think um, we understand some of the strategies for finding and building networks and um, so on in these more place-based ways. But I'm curious, like you've been very successful at um, you know being a beacon for niche communities, but. Um, it's also really hard. So how do you um, be a beacon when you're also having to protect yourself and also when you're operating in a world where there's so much noise and misinformation out there? Um, don't get any sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it's just something where, you know, it's really about consistency. Again, you know, because 12 years, I mean, MIDI students have been going on for eight years, the LGBT platform, seven years, mm -hmm. you know, crowd voice. It's just so many different things that you need many years to kind of understand and then gradually build until they become what they are today. And that also means being open to iterations. A lot of the times people create a platform or an application or a community and then it doesn't succeed right away and they say, I failed, you know. I, there's no way I can raise more money for this. There's nobody funding something like this. And then they just move on to the next best thing because they say, look, this didn't really work. Mm -hmm. But it's really about sticking around. If you care about this community, you stick around. That's the most important thing. You stick around and you see it through and you continue iterating until you crack it. With crowd, with crowd voice, I mean, the first times that we used it, I mean, for the first year at least, there was not a lot of interaction with it because it was mostly just used for an, to be internal. And then when the need was there, um, and we made people aware of this platform, the, the growth was completely explosive. But there was so much feedback coming in, and we had to be very immediate with implementing that feedback. Because if we know if we didn't listen to what this community wanted, and not just what we thought they wanted, it was not going to work. And because we did that, that's what made Crowd Voice, for example, successful globally and not just with that one niche community because other people start saying, hey, these people actually listen and they care about what we want, so let's go and interact with them and help get their help in implementing what I envision for how to crowdsource information, for example. Same thing with music. You know, a lot of people said, you know, we want this to we want this web application, but you know, we want to use it for offline listening because we don't have access to the internet. And we had, you know, we developed iPhone applications and Android applications and different kinds of applications that enabled offline listening, which meant that our user base went from being primarily in the Gulf to primarily in places like Palestine and Iraq and Syria where the need is much greater than w where it is for us, you know? So it's really just about sticking around and not waiting for somebody else to validate you is also very important. A lot of the time people think, oh, I'll wait and you know, join a competition or try to get a grant. And if it doesn't work out, people say nobody cares. You know, I'm going to go back to my day job or you know, something <laughs> like that. But it's really just about um, making sure that you know, if you care about the community, there's no way you're not going to succeed. That's just the way it is. because. At, at, the, at the end of the day, you're going to have to keep trying however many different iterations until it finally works for the community, especially if it's a solution that's not already available. And I think that's something that's really lost on a lot of people. It's just you get exhausted and you get burned out, but you have to kind of figure out what the limit is. Um, and that's what we did. You know, and there was a lot of the time when there was a community that we really wanted and it wasn't there, we just went out there and we created it. 
And today they remain, you know, really prominent communities where we live, and they've really helped launch other communities, and it really just continues to expand year by year. And it's now much bigger than we've ever thought we could ever have it be, you know. And it's scary sometimes because it's also outside of our control in that way. But um, it's also a really good feeling that you've kind of set out what you've wanted to do, and now your job is to kind of sustain it and grow it and keep doing more of it um, until we overthrow the regime. No, okay. <laughs> more, more hands? Yes, over there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I've been really struck by the uh, resilience that you embody, and um, I appreciate. I mean, you've spoken a bit about the power of um, the power of music, and the power of multimedia art, right, in various various ways to um, support people, sort of, right, like in collective action. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if there are any more kinds of uh, processes or practices, whether individual or social, that you could share with us that you found to be successful either in your own work or um, in your own sort of individual life or in your work with young people? So, so things that, sure, where do, sorry? Yeah, like strength, like where do you find the strength okay. to do the work that you do? Um, I think it's, a, it's in really, being a part of this community is really important. Um, kind of living in this, continuing to live in this environment. It's, it's really easy sometimes to kind of think, you know what, I'm gonna go and live abroad and start a life and move away from all of this. But I think it was really, imp what really drove me to continue doing this kind of work is also committing to staying home. Even though, even despite the risks, I think it's very important to sometimes surround yourself with a community that kind of needs this kind of work and really listen to them and really see what they're struggling with and how you're struggling with every day. Because that's just, it's one of those things where you feel, if I don't do it, nobody else will, you know? At the same time, it's really, if I do it, everybody else will. And that's the kind of, um, the, the kind of thing that really kept me going. Because a lot of the time, people come to me and they say, how do you create a website? And then you kind of transfer that knowledge. How do you create an open source application? You transfer that knowledge. How do you do this? How do you do that? Where do you go for hosting? How do you secure a server, you know, and things like that. And once you are able to collaborate and open the door to collaboration, um, it really becomes really inspiring, you know, because it's really not just about you yourself and you're just doing this for your own self and your own community, but you're really seeing how people who are in much graver situations, people who've lost their lives, they've lost their families, or their fathers are behind bars for serving a life sentence for being a political opposition member, um, people who've lost their children because they were shot in protest. And when they come to you and they say, this is touching for me and this is something I want to do, you really understand that the need is being served. And I think sticking around until you hear somebody else say, this was helpful, that's just all you need. And then it's just gonna go from there. Because you keep going back to that one story to that one person and you say, look, it, it, it influenced something that she wanted or she needed and I can continue kind of doing this. And it's just that grave sense of responsibility as well. I mean, I live in this country, I obviously want the best for it, and I think we can achieve it, you know, by just um, doing what we do today, and kind of every day taking it up a notch. And every day you kind of push yourself more and more, despite the white hairs, <laughs> and the sleepless nights, and the scary situations, and waking up to learn that your colleague is banned from traveling, or somebody was shot, or somebody, you know, it's really draining because there are many days where you do want to shut down. And it's gonna be a very frequent and uphill battle. But you just gotta work on your calf muscles. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. um, thank you, really interesting. Um, in, in a way, this is a, a, f a sort of follow up on the last um, question. There's a very interesting thread of humor sort of through your remarks. Um, you started by talking about getting in through political satire, uh, obviously a form of humor. Uh, your own sense of humor sort of sewn through your remarks, which are really interesting. And so when one thinks about humor in relation to activism, both 
in person and, and, and online, there's a sort of interesting way in which humor can be taken up. It's different face to face than it is, right, at a distance. Mm -hmm. uh, political satire becomes, uh, you know, the inside joke of, of, of finding a way to make a point that might not be so readily sort of um, suppressed mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So I just wonder whether you can say a bit more about the way in which you see humor taken up, the way in which it sustains. Humor can be dark, it can be thrown back at you, of course, right? So there's a, there's a it's not always sort of sustaining, it can, it can also be debilitating. Yeah. Um, so just the, the play of humor in all of this, which is really interesting. I mean, it's definitely a survival mechanism, you know, when you live in such this, this kind of environment. If you don't laugh about it, you know, there's, there's really so much you can do. Um, so I, I think it's really important. I mean, w w with my family and with my friends, when we come across a situation where something is really scary, we make light of it so that we're not, you know, um, w that, w that the fear doesn't become crippling. And I think that's why humor is so important and wh why we use humor with our colleagues. And even if they live in places like Libya or Yemen or many different places, um, we all use humor in a way. I mean, you, even when we're texting each other and somebody's talking about um, somebody got arrested or somebody something, something happened, um, there's always a way to kind of make light of the situation, regardless of how threatening it is, because otherwise it will just completely take over you. And there's so much, you know, I mean, it's just, even in the very beginning when we started doing this work, we knew immediately to move to political satire because that was also a way for us to kind of deal with um, the oppression from, from the very top, you know? And we just felt like humor was a really interesting way to communicate with other people. Um, it builds this kind of connection that you can't through advocacy at all. Even if you're standing next to a person at a protest. But if you, you know, elicit a laughter for somebody, that's, it's like they're already an ally, you know? And they're already, you're already sharing so many intimate moments and, and that's just something that you can't replicate no matter what you do. In fact, so many of the songs on Midi Students are political satire and humor, you know, and people are kind of, it's really huge in the Middle East because otherwise we'd be, dr you know, drying each other's tears with pillows the whole time, you know, and so I think it's really important for us to kind of figure out ways to survive. I mean, other people, they do other things, you know, to deal with that kind of thing. For me, humor is really important. If you can't laugh about the situation that you're in, no matter how difficult it is, um, you're gonna get burnt out really quickly and you're just not gonna feel that relationship and that connection with your colleagues and your community and you're just not, it's just, it's a kind of depression that is very difficult to crawl out of. And it's very easy to be chronically depressed in a place like the region because everything, everything is working against you if you're doing the kind of work that I do and if you're the kind of person that I am. If you're a queer woman in human rights, it doesn't go my, any more downhill, <laughs> you know? So you have to laugh about it. Yeah. Okay, over here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have two, two questions. Uh, the first one is I'm, I'm curious to know about the role of schools. Um, if, if they are playing a role, if there's so much restriction from the government that they're not playing a role in kind of cultivating the kinds of resistance through technology that you're describing, mm -hmm. um, or if you think that they should in Bahrain and also elsewhere. That's my first question. The second question is, so I'm originally from Iran and I grew up in the United States and one thing that I've been really inspired by um, is increasing forms of solidarity between people from the Middle East mm -hmm. in the United States. So people from Iran really, um, resonating with the struggles of people from Palestine mm -hmm. or people from Egypt. And that's something that I think has been emergent over the last 10 years. And alongside that, there's been this desire to do something together to understand our collective experience, but also to not lose touch with our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. But I think I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware of any platforms or movements that are connecting sort of Middle East diaspora to people in the Middle East and if there's any kind of interesting trends in, around technology or platforms that are trying to do that work or um, anything you see in your own context. 
Yeah, so for the first question, um, schools don't play a big role right now. A lot of it is really controlled. Um, you know, they try to push things like science, no, you know, technology, robotics, but really not at all anything in terms of dissident movements and things like that. So there is an effort. They're mostly in private schools. A lot of the time they're unaffordable for a lot of the people. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends. But in the Gulf, um, definitely not. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak so much for, you know, Egypt and some of the other places because it does differ school to school. Mm -hmm. Some schools are very adamant about get out there and do something and some schools are just, you know, no, this is just, you know, you're here to study religion and grammar and math and we don't deal with other things. That's something you deal with at home, not at school. Right. And for us in the Gulf, it was very similar to that. Mm -hmm. It was here, this is not a place for politics. This is not a place for sectarian discussions. This is a place where you just learn these basics and then you go home. Right. You know, um, so for the second one, it's really interesting. There's definitely been a lot of effort in trying to bring, but also very niche focused. There's, um, for example, communities and platforms where you know the diaspora here are trying to connect with people back home. Yeah. I mean, even at Midi Students, there's a lot of Iranian Americans, Arab Americans that mm. are playing music back here, also as a way to kind of connect with the mm. roots and kind of connect with a lot of the musicians. They're trying to figure out how to get visas so that they bring and play. Mm. You know, there was an uh, Arab American festival in Philadelphia that happened not long ago, and that was very much part of the conversation mm. was how do we come together and build more of these relationships, not just as Arab Americans, but also with our peers back home. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing with um, Iranians and Turks and Kurds, and, um, but also with LGBT individuals, mm -hmm. saying, how do we create a community where we can fundraise for LGBT movements back home and help them build more sustainable communities and products and things like wow. that? So there's definitely been um, very private kind of discussions and events because a lot of these people want to fly back home too. They right. don't want to be banned or put on a list, either leaving or coming back. So that's why um, a lot of the discussions happen. You go to somebody, for example, now I'm here, there's an Arab American in, L in LA. So I say, hey, look, I'm going to be flying out of LAX on a certain date. It would be great if we can get together and do something. Mm -hmm. So then they, he organizes a private event where all other Arab Americans or people from the Gulf, maybe living in exile, they show up and we start talking about, okay, these are the needs of the people back home. What can you do to help? Mm -hmm. You know. And so, but it happens very privately and very it's organic. very face to face mm -hmm. because these people also don't want to be kind of in the limelight. You know, they've got jobs, they've got people back home, families they don't want to put into. Um, hot situations. So it's definitely happening, but very much at the grassroots underground level. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank okay. you. So there's a hand oh, back there, I see. Uh, coming back to the point that I thought was really strong on that idea of looking to nonprofits, the failure of philanthropy in this country, and thinking about how that connects with, uh, with young people organizing in these spaces, I I think it's really interesting looking at this conversation, sort of seeing the absence of the terms of civil discourse, mm -hmm. which is how I see it discussed in my own world in, in high schools, mm -hmm. right, when we're talking about online engagement. Uh, and I think that's really interesting, so, sort of coming out of Dana's talk yesterday when we're looking at how has that framing of, if we all just have this big conversation, right, that this liberal utopia will emerge and that everybody will hear each other and will be cool. Um, and looking at how that's sort of like uh, shifting to these ideas of like what is the value of being uncivil, right? And what is the sort of effect of this civilizing force of nonprofit philanthropy, right? And I think it's really interesting within that to see you talk about uh, the role of hip hop, right? And of organic youth cultures that exist outside of uh, philanthropy and nonprofits mm -hmm. and our structures, um, and that that really butts up against this idea of civil discourse, that yeah. hip hop and punk and metal and techno or whatever are often not about saying, hey, I am here, you, and I'm over here and this is what I have to say. <laughs> it's like, fuck you, uh, this is me and this is what I'm taking, yeah. right? And that that is quite often the opposite of how uh, online engagements are framed for us as this open conversation. Yeah. Was that a question? Not or? a question. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay for a second. No, yeah, no rising of the voice at the end there. 100%, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I 
hundred percent. We gotta change phil how philanthropy works in this country for sure. You know, because it doesn't just affect. I mean, w I say this country because it also affects. You know, it's one of the places that we can only go to support, unfortunately, because in the Middle East, no, everybody, everything is traced. And you can't raise money there. So, you know, so it's really difficult. Um, if you raise money, it can be for something as safe as schools, something as a workshop, or you know, dealing with refugees and all things that are very important. But when it comes to stuff like this, there's just no money in it whatsoever. And so, why are people like us being, you know, um, stuck in a situation where we have to think, do I have to move back in with my family and give away my apartment and sell my car to find MIDI students for another two years, or you know? Can I find somebody who will support something like this? And the money is not a lot, but you can't find somebody who sees eye to eye that this stuff is really important because there's no opportunities for people like us for the most part. Um, I'm only am able to get the recognition that I have today because it was 12 years of working my ass off. And there's a lot of people that don't have that kind of background and who, who are kind of late in the game, but that doesn't mean that what they do is any less important than what I'm doing today or any less effective or any less influential. But they have zero support and they're constantly coming to us and we're, the only thing we can do is really, you know, what do we have that we can sell? And I think we're very t tedious to be part of this situation because we come here and we see how many things are being funded for the Middle East, not with the Middle East. People are funding people in DC to do stuff for us without engaging with us, without understanding the cultural context, the political context, even something like the language itself. So they come in there and they're being paid five, six, seven million dollars to do a project for LGBT youth in the Middle East when none of them are LGBT, when none of them understand how to communicate with LGBT individuals, and they just don't understand the sensitivities around this discussion, culturally or otherwise. That has to stop or else we're not gonna get anywhere and it's just money being wasted. We need to channel the money someplace where it's resourceful and we need to also stop political agendas in philanthropy. Because that's not philanthropy, that's propaganda. And we need to start calling it that. So I think if there is a way to pull a question out of Dan's rich comments, it has to do with this question of civility and the power of trying to build a civil space where we work through our differences versus a much more assertive, uncivil statement that disrupts the established order and ensures that certain voices get heard. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how do you think about the relative priority of those two, those two moments of speech? Is there a value, value in civility and reaching across the aisle, or should, is, is there the most urgent thing to make sure that voices that have been silenced are heard no matter what? I think the priority for now, for the time being, is definitely the first part, because that's not, there's not enough of that happening. And if there was enough of that happening, then the second part would happen naturally. You know, so I definitely think there's, there has to be people that reach out and to listen, and there's not a lot of listening. It's sort of just people talking over each other and the distractions, you know, and there's just, uh, just so many different things that are preventing us from really having a space that we can really cherish something that is effective, that is influential, that is replicable across different regions. Um, and so just not having that is why we're not having enough voices being heard today and where there's no sustainability in continuing to ensure that these voices aren't heard without having to sell their furniture. <laughs> yeah, we're all Still. opposed to selling furniture here. Yeah, it was my favorite car. Okay, yes, was the hand down, or did someone have a mic already? Oh, good, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Thank you so much. Um, as I'm listening to you talk, I'm thinking about um, leadership. Like, mm -hmm. when I hear you talk about the work that you do, you clearly are taking a leadership role in bringing people together. And at the same time, right now, especially in kind of, uh, with the, the digital space, we see a lot more of this kind of horizontal leadership, right? Where uh, many people are coming together and taking, taking leadership roles. And there's like pluses to that, and there's a kind of sense of safety, right? But then the take, the, maybe the minus is that the message can get co-opted, right? Yeah. And that you don't know who's speaking. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about leadership and leadership in these times and, and um, just challenges and also um, possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a really great question. Um, when it comes to leadership, I've always, I, I had to really try my best to not be the face of things, which is part of the reason why I'm anonymous today. It's not just 
for security reasons. But I feel if sometimes you're that much physically visible, and it's not just your voice, but it's just your full identity, then you're the face of that movement, period. And nobody else can come. But if you kind of just become an audio, that enables other people to say, oh, I also feel the same way. Or I will also speak for the movement. And maybe they themselves are not seen. You know? So it's not just me that is physically anonymous. I also have other colleagues that are physically anonymous for security reasons for the most part, but also because of that sense that everybody here, we would like them to have leadership abilities and things like that. Where I come from, you have to have leadership skills um, when it comes to things like setting up the platform, you need to know who's going to be responsible for the design, who's going to be responsible to paying the hosting fees. I mean, that's not stuff that you can be like, oh, we're all doing this together, you know, because there's going to be a zillion bugs and everything's going to dis be destroyed and things like that. So you have to ensure that when the quality of something as simple as just how the application runs, that definitely needs its own set of kind of leadership skills and a team and a kind of separate thinking around that. But when it comes to the community itself, I mean, for the LGBT community, nobody knows who the admin is, nobody knows who the moderators are, you know, it's really just that anonymous space where everybody kind of feels welcome and it really creates a really interesting environment where people get along without feeling like I need to to you know, abide by somebody else's rules or somebody else's political ideology or religious identity in order to fit in the space. Um, and it's the same thing when we created our blogger you know, um, many years ago, um, when we were having group blogs, anybody could come and register and it would go up there and it would be completely unmoderated. And we were not scared of co someone coming up and co-opting because it, it is a voice we want to hear, even if it's a voice that we disagree with because it enabled us in the comments to tear that person apart. You know? <laughs> and that was something that was really kind of organically grew out of that, was just these kind of leaderless movements that kind of had leaders in it to kind of sustain it and grow it, but that person didn't just become the face of the entity of the organization, whereas everybody else was just forgotten and felt, oh, if I'm not like her, then I'm not accepted, you know? But it's different for different cultures as well. You know, I mean, that's something that works very well in the Middle East. It may not so much work so well here, because here I s often see that when you're anonymous, people just don't take you seriously. They're like, what if it's one of Sarah Palin's kids? You know? <laughs> so it's just like you constantly have to um, understand how you do verify, validate your identity without also being the face of everything. Because there's also that culture of narcissism that is unfortunately very prevalent in our space. And that's something that is very difficult to kind of turn away from. Um, and you definitely see really legit movements and struggles that are sometimes being taken over by narcissists, you know? And so that's something that we try to discourage. Because when that happens, you lose everything and you lose the credibility of the entire message. And that's not something we could afford to do right now, so. Well, I, th I thank all of you for listening so closely and actively. We probably heard a pin drop in the room during much of this. And let me end by asking Ezra the question that's the title of the, con the session. Uh, can digital youth still change the world? Absolutely, 100%. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you both so very much for a really fabulous and uh, intensely interesting conversation, uh, hopefully to be continued amongst all of us. Um, just a couple of announcements um, following that. Thank you. Uh, at 4 o'clock, Sybil Madison um, Boyd will host um, the Ignites Part 2. So welcome back for that. It will be the closing session followed. Uh, by an urging to you to fill in the survey for which there will, we, we are bribing you, there will be giveaways. So, um, <laughs> that's right. Um, you, you're not supposed to say that, Mimi. <laughs> the enticement has maybe been undercut. <laughs> But uh, please do uh, fill in the, uh, the survey, and we hope to see you back here for, um, um, to see you back here for the Ignites, uh, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. That was good. Oh, my pleasure. Uh-huh, yes. <laughs>